Now we come to chapter uh, 13, Revelation 13, and verse 16. It says here, and the false prophet now, he causes all the small and the great, and the rich and the poor, and the free men and the slaves to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. This is called the mark of the beast. There's going to be a mark they have to receive on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that there will be no, no one should be able to buy or to sell even the necessities of life except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, this teaches us that the Antichrist is going to give people the option of either being public followers of him or secret followers of him. Public followers of him means the mark is on your forehead. Secret followers of him means the mark is in your right hand and you can keep it hidden. Now, this has an application for us even today because we have considered in 1 John 2, 18 and 19 that the spirit of the Antichrist is already at work in Christendom. And it is possible for people today to publicly follow the Antichrist, for example, the prostitutes, the gamblers, the drunkards, the film stars, they publicly follow the Antichrist. But it is also possible to secretly follow the Antichrist, to do unrighteous things in one's office with one's right hand, sign false statements, get a little more money, give a little bribe with the right hand, and then come and sit in the meeting as a spiritual brother, a spiritual sister, to praise God and have a reputation. That is to get the mark of the beast right now in your right hand, right here. And you see, there are people who don't want to have it on the forehead because then they won't have a good testimony in the assembly, but they'd like to have it secretly somewhere because there's some profit from it in the world by compromise. And here is where our faith is tested and our devotion to Jesus, that we stand clear of this mark of the beast in any form, not on our forehead, and what is even more dangerous, not secretly on our right hand, where the other believers don't know anything about what we're doing in our private life and our private financial affairs, etc. But we stay clear, like the Apostle Paul, we say, I have the marks of Jesus Christ on my body, Galatians 6.17. I don't need the mark of anyone else. And we see here, it's going to be quite a test in the last day when you have to, for example, if you can't buy food unless you have the mark of the beast, that's going to be quite a test. The test that came to uh, Eve in the Garden of Eden was a test of food. And the first temptation that came to Jesus in the uh, wilderness was the test of food. You're dying. Why don't you turn the stones to bread? And Jesus said, it's not necessary to live. It's only necessary to obey the word of God. I want to tell you this, brothers and sisters. It's the person who has that attitude who is going to be an overcomer in the last day. It is not necessary to survive. It is only necessary to obey the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. If we don't have that attitude, that it's better to obey God's word and die, rather than compromise and live, we are going to be sucked away in this apostasy and falling away that there is in Christendom already. Further, verse 18 says here, Here is wisdom, and let him who has understanding Calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. Six in the Bible is the number of man. Man was created on the sixth day. That's why we say six is the number of man. Seven is the number of perfection when God rested. And uh, eight is the number of a new creation because the eighth day is the beginning of a new week. You know that. And in music, the eighth note is the beginning of a new octave. 
So eight is the number of new creation. It is all in creation, the number eight. And six is the number of man. Now what does it mean when it says, let him calculate the number of the beast? In the Greek language in which the New Testament was written, they use alphabets, the Greek alphabets, for numbers. For example, the Greek alphabet alpha has got the value one. And like that, right down through the letters of the Greek alphabet, each alphabet has got a numeric value. And I want to tell you something here about the name Jesus. The name Jesus, it's difficult to write it in English, how it is written in the Greek language, but the closest to writing it in the English would be Jesus with six letters, I-H-S-O-U-S. And in the Greek language, these letters have got, a, each has got a different value. And when you total up the value of these different letters in the Greek language, Jesus, the total value comes to 888. You see, that's very significant. It's 888. It's exactly 888. If you're interested in the value of each, it's 10 plus 8 plus 200 plus 70 plus 400 plus 200. That's 888. That is the number of the new creation. Jesus rose up on the first day of the week, that is the eighth day, and began a new creation. Now here is the Antichrist, whose number is 666. And this seems to indicate that whoever the Antichrist is going to be, his name is going to add up to 666. That will be one indication that this is the man. And also, we can say that since six is the number of man, 666 is man's attempt to be like the Trinity, to be like God. And this is the significance of six three times, because God is a Trinity, the Antichrist, man attempting to be God. Now we move on to chapter 14. And there is a contrast here, just like there were those who received the mark of the beast on their right hand or forehead. Here we read of certain other people who also have a mark, but this mark is not in the hand or the forehead, it is only on the forehead. Chapter 14, verse 1, I looked and behold a lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 having his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads, not on their right hand. Notice the contrast. What does it teach us? It teaches us that the followers of the Antichrist can be public followers or secret followers, but the followers of Jesus Christ can only be publicly known as his followers. There is no such thing as a secret follower of Christ. That's a lot of humbug. People talk about it. But Jesus said, if you don't confess me before men, if you are ashamed to confess me before men, I will be ashamed to confess you. That's why I say, dear friends, if you're working in an office, I hope the mark of the Lord is so evident symbolically that it's on your forehead so that everyone in your office knows that you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no such thing as having a little mark on your hand and being a secret follower of Christ. Anyone sitting here who thinks he's a secret follower of Christ, I just want to tell you, you're living under a world of delusion. There is only one type of follower of Christ, a public, openly known follower of Jesus Christ who's got the mark right on the forehead, everybody knows. And I tell you, it's an absolute shame for a lot of believers in our land. I see Hindus who come to the offices with the... Um, something like the mark of the beast on their forehead. And Christians who are absolutely ashamed to be publicly known as followers of Jesus Christ, shame on them. What type of Christians are they? I'll tell you. Compromisers. They're not in this number here. 
They are not the people who are unashamed to boldly admit that they are followers of Jesus Christ. They are wondering whether they'll get their promotion if they confess to be followers of Christ. They are wondering whether they'll get their increment. They are lovers of money, lovers of promotion, not bold witnesses of Jesus Christ. The Lamb and his followers are marked by this. They are publicly known as disciples of Jesus Christ. Their relatives know that they are wholehearted disciples. They are not compromises in the midst of their unconverted relatives. They are not compromises in their office. They are not compromises in their neighborhood. The mark is clearly seen. And every time we see a Hindu man with a mark on his forehead, let that speak to us. If that man is not ashamed to show that he worships the devil, why in the world should I be ashamed to admit that I am a son of the living God? The Lamb was standing with 144,000, having his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads. Now this has um, a symbolic meaning too, because in the Old Testament, name symbolized nature. Verse 1, I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, with him 144,000. Now this is not the 144,000 that we saw earlier in chapter 7, because they were from the tribes of Israel, 12,000 each, and the tribes of Israel certainly don't follow the Lamb, that's clear. They don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. This is another group altogether. This is from the church. This is what the book of Revelation calls the overcomers. You read off in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, he who overcomes, he who overcomes, he who overcomes, this is the group spoken of there, and the, their characteristic is they reflect the nature of the Lamb and of the Father. And that's a good question to ask ourselves. In our attitude towards other people, do I reflect the nature of the Lamb who, when he was sheared, kept his mouth shut, who, when he was slaughtered, was silent, who could see people taking away his rights, tripping him, and be silent. I'll tell you, some people say, you mean to say it's such a small number of over overcomers? I ask you this question. How many believers have you seen in your life who never lose their temper, who can learn to keep quiet under provocation? I tell you, it's a pretty small number. Who know how to follow the Lamb, in being silent, when deprived of one's rights, who know how what it is to take up the cross and die. There are not many, but here are those who have wholeheartedly followed and who have now that nature which they inwardly acquired has begun to shine through their personality, in their face. And it says the nature of his father. That is God's desire for every one of us that we grow up to maturity where we can be like fathers towards other people. God is training us. We start off as children. We grow up to be sons. We read that in 1 John 2. And then we grow up to be fathers towards other people, denying ourselves to serve them. Longing to lead others onto maturity. His nature, the nature of the Lamb, and the nature of the Father. Brothers and sisters, this should be our passion, that the nature of the Lamb of God and the nature of the Father should become ours so completely that it begins to be reflected through our personality. Blessed are those who take that seriously. I believe with all my heart, I don't have a shadow of doubt in my mind, that these are the overcomers. And it says here in verse 2 and 3, I heard a voice from heaven, like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder, and the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. That's the music of heaven. It's a music full of praise, worship, joy, ecstatic joy in the presence of the Father. And it says here, there were certain people on earth who learned this while they were on earth. 
These are the ones who stood on Mount Zion. Now, Mount Zion, mentioned in verse 1, is just another name for the heavenly Jerusalem. And if you turn back to Revelation 3, I want to tell you who's, who has got the name of Jerusalem written on them, Revelation 3.12. We considered that when we studied Revelation 3, but just to refresh our memory so that we understand it clearly. He who overcomes, not everyone, but he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, says the Lord Jesus. And he will not go out from it anymore and look at the names that are going to be written on the forehead of whom? Of the overcomers. I will write upon him the name of my God. What is the name of God that Jesus revealed to us? What is it? Father. That's right. I have revealed your name to them, Jesus said in John 17. That's the name of Father. And he's going to write that name on the forehead, not of everyone, but the overcomers. And the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, that is the bride of Christ. Now that verse clearly teaches that it is the overcomers who constitute the bride of Christ, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my name, the name of the Lamb. Notice that. The name of the Father, the name of the Lamb, and the name of the New Jerusalem. That's what we see in Revelation 14. They stand on Mount Zion, which is the heavenly Jerusalem, and his name and the name of his Father. So when you put Revelation 3.12 into Revelation 14.1, it's pretty clear that this is referring to the overcomers. We've only got to compare scripture with scripture, get rid of our preconceived ideas and traditions, and we understand it clearly. And 